All right, welcome. Let's go ahead and get started. A couple of important announcements. I'll start with the one that probably you like more, and that is that we're not going to have class on Thursday. If you look at the uh, course schedule, it's listed as a makeup day. And the original idea was that if we had uh, a class canceled due to bad weather or if you guys didn't learn Excel fast enough, then that would be a day to catch up on things. But as it ends up, we've had a mild winter, and you're uh, learning Excel plenty quick. So um, Thursday, no class. But tomorrow, I don't know if you've already seen the email announcements, uh, the governor is going to be on campus, and he's going to be here in the engineering building at 12 o'clock. And so uh, students are invited to participate in that, and uh, they're going to provide, uh, like, food afterwards so yeah it's if you notice here in the building they've been like really scrambling getting things uh, ready for the governor to be here you know like they're sweeping up the driveway and uh, they're trying to make it nice so definitely if you want to be a part of the spectacle uh, it's down in the structures lab which is on the first floor it's that big um, lab that's usually locked. It has some glass windows by the side. Just follow the crowd is the point. Tomorrow at noon, your participated would be appreciated. Participation would be appreciated. All right, so today what we're going to do is just pick up a few loose ends on Excel, and this is actually our last Excel lecture of the semester. And uh, after this, we're going to be switching over to a different program called MATLAB. Any questions on the announcements before we begin? All right. So um, thus far, we've mostly been doing x, y scatter plots. And that's what you'll probably use most of the time in engineering, because that's the most appropriate way to demonstrate uh, experimental data. Um, but there are some other types of plots that are sometimes used in less technical reports. And it's still uh, worthwhile to figure out how to use those. And so we're going to do a, a little bit of work with bar charts and line charts. And so uh, those are just some of the other options here that are under the uh, charts tab. So insert charts. And uh, so let's talk about pie charts. And this is the kind of thing that you see a lot of when you're in elementary school. But then after elementary school, I mean, unless you read the USA Today, you don't see pie charts as much uh, after that. And um, so in engineering, uh, it's discouraged to use pie charts. And so why do you think that is? Here's an illustration of some data being represented by pie charts. So why do you think that we say that we discourage you from using pie charts to summarize your data? What's the problem with these? They look colorful, right? They look the same? It doesn't show trends. It's hard to know, unless you've got a very, uh, very fine visual perception, it's hard to know what is bigger than which. And so, for example, in uh, Series A compared to Series B, which one has more yellow? B? I don't know. I guess maybe. Yeah. It's obvious on C, but... I mean, you have to look at it for a moment. So it's difficult to interpret these just because the comparisons can be so uh, close together. But if you represent that same data as a bar chart instead, then you can, number one, see which is the biggest on each series. And so here, for instance, I mean, you could, by doing this comparison of each, a relative measurement in your mind of the area of each, you can see that black is the biggest. But it's a lot faster when you see that black is the tallest line in Series A. And then the other thing that's nice is that in a bar chart, it's easier to compare each color across different series. And so, for example, you can see that in Series A, yellow is higher than it is in Series B and so on. And so bar charts are a more effective way of illustrating data. Now there are ways to put like uh, data labels on a pie chart, but then by the time you do that, you might as well not even have a figure. It might as well just be a data table if you're putting the labels on the pie chart. 
So bar charts are better than pie charts. Um, here's another one that illustrates why pie charts are sometimes misused. You can see figures like this a lot if you get into uh, some of the data that's put out by uh, the United Nations. And the reason why I mention that is I've downloaded some, um, some water data from the United Nations and they're sort of showing what different uses of water there is uh, by country. And so what is the problem with a chart like this? In the first one, it was because you can't tell the difference between them. So what is a concern with this pie chart? The colors look the same, right? Yeah, so uh, which is electricity and which is pharmaceuticals? Because these blues are pretty close here. And it's not like I'm colorblind, but I don't want to waste all afternoon trying to match up uh, lilac blue versus uh, violet blue or whatever that the case may be. And in fact, there are some darker ones. So it's just kind of, uh, there's too much information for one thing on this pie chart and then trying to distinguish the colors is another kind of uh, compounding challenge. Alright, so um, let's practice using, a, uh, using Excel to create figures for this following data. This is just some hypothetical data of how many of each they might have in a grocery store and um, although I've been calling this a bar chart if you look at the, the descriptions that Excel gives to different types of charts, they would call this a column chart. And a bar chart is when the data actually extends horizontally rather than vertically. So in this case, this is a column chart. Um, here's another chart style, which is a line chart. Now, I, I personally, I mean, sometimes line charts are useful, but in this case, does anybody here have an, an idea of what my concern is going to be with this figure representing the data that we've got. So, guess my complaint is the name of this game. So, guess my complaint with this figure. You guys have been doing pretty well so far. What don't I like about this figure? Yeah, go ahead. Like when you start to do the major increase, you might not be able to tell like the actual number of apples and oranges. Okay, very good. Yeah, so. Um, so here, for example, these slopes are pretty similar, and so um, where the data point is could be concealed if the slope between these two lines is the same, and uh, you can't take it over here and find out the actual number quite as easily. So that's one that I hadn't even thought of, but that's a great observation. Other ideas on how, why this is a bad way? I mean, line charts are useful for some things, but... When it comes to representing kiwis, grapes, plums, and so on, this data has no relationship. Uh, the, the number of grapes is not related to the number of kiwis. Uh, lines are meant to show trends over time. And sometimes you see, like on cartoons or TV shows, lines where the stock market is going down or the stock market is going up. Here, it, there's no trend connecting the data. And so you shouldn't have a line that kind of implies there's a, a trend or a relationship here. These are all each individual data points. And so my complaint here is that when you're graphing data, be careful not to use connecting lines when there isn't necessarily a trend that you're trying to communicate. All right, so with that said, go ahead into ME Online, and there's an Excel file right on the front page there for class 19. And class 19, that the Excel file asks you to create a, uh, a bar chart. It's really going to be a column chart. And then use a line chart. And uh, these are just pictures that I've pasted into the Excel file. Create an actual chart that is the same as these pictures. And so what you'll be doing is you'll be going into Insert tab. You'll be going into the Insert tab and then creating both a line chart and a column chart with this given data.
kisses. Okay, so probably by now everybody has their uh, charts. You may have noticed something strange about this worksheet. It doesn't have any lines, right? So that's actually something that you can toggle on and off under the View tab, these grid lines. You can switch them on and off. And uh, I guess usually it's helpful to have them there when you're working on tabular data, but then there might be instances where you choose to switch it off just to kind of clean up the uh, clean up the visual appeal of what you're working on to make it simpler to find what you're working for. All right, any questions about how to make a bar chart or a line chart? All right. Another interesting option that we haven't told you about yet in Excel is a way of uh, looking at the formulas on a spreadsheet. And so under the formula tab is a button that says show formulas. And what it can do, you'll remember that we did an in-class exercise related to projectile motion. Well, that's on the second tab of the file that you downloaded today. One way of looking at what you've got in a spreadsheet is, of course, here in the formula bar, if you move the cursor to a certain cell, it tells you what the equation is. And uh, you'll notice that if I move my cursor into the formula bar, then it's going to bring up some colored uh, indicators on the screen that helps me to find the references. And so it's one thing just to click on the cell and then to read. Now I'm just looking at the formula bar. It says C11. And so I can use my finger to point at the screen and go and find, OK, it's referring to the angle and radians. But if I actually click inside the cell, then it's changing the reference, the, the reference cells to different colors. And so the color coding kind of makes it easier to speed up the auditing of, uh, of finding out what formula is in which cell. But even faster than that is if you uh, use the Show Formulas button. And so what I'd like you to do is try each one of these four things just to get a feel for how they work. The show formulas button and switch it off when you're done toggling it back and forth. Do the trace precedence button and uh, try that for a time of 1.0 seconds for the Y. Try the trace dependence and then uh, we'll talk about protecting the sheet a little bit later. So for now just do operations one through three. All right, so uh, the first thing I asked you to try was the Show Formulas button. So if you go to the Formulas tab and then click on Show Formulas, suddenly your nice spreadsheet turns into kind of a mess, just a, a bunch of cell references. And I've actually had students print this and turn it in before, <laughs> accidentally thinking that this is what I wanted to see rather than the answers. Um, the, the way that you'd actually use this is if you had some problems and you're trying to figure out like where's the mistake and so how could this be useful well for example if you scroll down through you can look at what's staying the same and what's changing and so it'll tell you for example if the uh, if the relative referencing is adjusting in a way that you intended or if the correct cells are locked all the way through sometimes it's easy to get a uh, to accidentally overwrite an equation or to leave one in the old version before you made a change. And so the main reason that you turn on the show formulas is just so that you could debug if you're having some kind of a problem. Um, with, if any of you end up taking fluid mechanics, I often ask my students to show the formulas that they used in lab reports. And this isn't what I mean. Um, when you're when you're using Excel to communicate technical information, um, 
what sometimes is a useful thing to do is below the table, then you define what each column is. So T, you'd say time in seconds, and then how you got that. And so this time is just, um, we know the, uh, the increment, the time step, and 20 steps. So you'd say something like uh, there were 20 time steps over a duration of 3.06 seconds. And then, you know, like for the X, you'd explain which formula you used for each one. So that's kind of two different ways to talk about showing the formulas. And one, one is just where you're explaining to the reader who's going to see the printed spreadsheet later on. But then this button is just more about looking for mistakes. All right. So the other thing I wanted to try out was the uh, trace precedence. And um, so let's look at, for a time of 1.07 seconds, the Y value. If you click on that, trace precedence, these blue arrows indicate what cell references go into the formula. And how it's useful is if we made a change to any one of these, then it's going to update this equation, the, the result of the equation. If we make changes to other ones, then it's not. And so let's try that out. If we try, if we change G, we'll check to see if uh, that's adjusting it from 10.44. So we change this to 15, then sure enough, it changes the Y value. Let me put it back. But if I change, for example, the number of steps, which isn't indicated with the blue dot, to 25, oh, it did. I'm surprised it did. Oh, I think I know. Uh, if you push it multiple times, so I'm going to do control Z to take it back. Um, all right, so that button, if you click the precedence button more than once, then it starts to show, um, for example, it's not a direct reference, like a, a first time receipt, uh, reference. And so let me remove the arrow. So when I click it one time, it's showing only the cells that come from like directly into the function that's listed here. But then when I click it a second time, then it's going to show which uh, cells go into other ones like a secondary dependence. And so for example, this time step of 1.07 is influenced by the T step, although it's not like the, uh, the first direct reference in the formula, then it's referenced indirectly because one of the cells that this formula references goes to it. And so I can click it again, and it will step back even further. And so um, how many steps back you want to go, it will uh, indicate. And a similar thing is uh, the trace dependence. And so for C4, which is the G, if we click trace uh, dependence, it will show me all of the places where that's directly being referenced, that value for G. All right, so that's pretty interesting. Another way to audit your spreadsheet and make sure that everything's fine. Um, so we did the show formulas. We did the uh, arrows that show the precedence and dependence. All right, let's try pasting because there's a couple of different ways to paste um, figures that you've created into other programs such as Word. All right, so begin Word, start it up. And what we're going to do is copy and paste the graph that we created into a blank document. So you've got a blank document that's going, and you've got this bar and line charts tab. Take the, uh, the bar chart, and you can copy it either by pressing Control-C or uh, Home Copy. And then if you go into Microsoft Word, you can paste by home paste. So there's a couple of different ways that it can paste a graph into a Word document. And down here, it gives you the option of controlling. If you didn't control it when you were pasting, you can change it after the fact. Uh, what it's doing right now, the type of paste that it did was, oops. All right, the type of paste that it did 
was a Microsoft Office graphic object. That's the default paste style. And the advantage of having it pasted like this is if you do something like change the width, then it'll automatically adjust the text so that it doesn't look warped. By comparison, if we had chosen a file, pay, oh, sorry, a home, paste, special, and we choose a uh, picture, enhanced meta file. So if we just have it pasted as an image, then if I change the width, then all of a sudden the text kind of gets stretched out, like the aspect ratio of the text is messed up. And so the advantage of this default paste is that if you want to make changes in the width, then you can do that. And in fact, you can make changes to other things as well. You can change the, uh, the colors and the font sizing. So try doing that paste and um, do this. First of all, paste it as a graphic object, which is the default style. Change the width, make some changes to the font, and change the bars so that they're not blue anymore, but instead are green. And then try pasting it as a picture like I just showed you, you're going to have to do paste special to get the option. Sometimes you pasting as pictures, are, as pictures are useful rather than as a graphic object. Like if you didn't want someone to mess around with your image, like if you got it just the way you like it and you don't want there to be further adjustments, then pasting as a picture can be useful. And then uh, we'll do this last one together after you've played around with the first two. So I'm going to first paste as a graphic object. And the advantage of that is you can adjust things, like you can change the colors if you like. Change it to green. You can uh, change fonts of things if it's this style. You could make it bold. You could make it larger so that the text is easier to read. But you don't have that same capacity if you're pasting it as a picture. You can't make the changes. So here I'm going to copy and then just paste it as a picture. Paste special and I'll use this enhanced meta file. It doesn't really matter which style, but like if I try and make it wider, if it's a picture, then it's just getting stretched out in a weird way. And if I double click because I want to change it from blue to green, there's it's just pictures there. There, there aren't individual elements. So it's just the pixels that cannot be changed. Now, this third one, this third option, MS Excel chart object, when you paste that, you're basically pasting the entire spreadsheet into the document, not just one graph. So let me, uh, let me try that. I'm going to move down onto a fresh page here, and I'm going to copy and then paste. Okay, so I'm going to just highlight this graph and um, paste special as the Microsoft Excel chart object. Now when I do that, it's putting the entire spreadsheet in there, and you, you can see it's making it pretty big. So first of all, let me click on it and try and change the size a little bit, this viewing window. What we're doing is we're making a window that views the uh, views that entire Excel file. And if you double click on it, then it sort of opens up that window a little bit further. You can see now suddenly I've got Excel inside of Microsoft Word. So by double clicking on it, it's now brought up all of the same tools that I get on Microsoft Excel. And in fact, down here, you can access the underlying data. So all of the worksheets are also embedded into your uh, Microsoft Word. So that can be a useful thing if you wanted to email somebody one document that had not only your report, but also the underlying data, then you could embed the entire spreadsheet 
in this way. But maybe sometimes you don't want somebody to see all of your data. If it's proprietary or maybe you put a bunch of, uh, I don't know, rude comments about a class inside of a spreadsheet and you just want to put the figures but not all the other stuff. So you have to be a little bit careful about putting in the, uh, the entire workbook if you don't necessarily intend that. So it's just basically a view window and uh, it can be a little bit complicated to use. Any questions about that? Those three different options? Yes? So, uh, alright, so you start off by just taking one of the elements from the spreadsheet and copy it. And then you moved over to Microsoft Word and we're going to paste special and choose Microsoft Excel chart object and then it should give you compared to the other charts that you've been pasting it should be larger and then if you just work like on these edge elements it'll change the size of it but then if you double click in the body of the uh, of the item then that's where it'll give you access to all the tabs and then the new tools come up all right so there's one last thing that we want to show you how to do in Excel and that is how to protect your uh, spreadsheet like let's say that you want someone to be able to see it but you don't want them to mess it up you, um, now you're worried that they'll create alternate versions of the spreadsheet where the formulas are corrupted or um, you know in an engineering office sometimes common spreadsheets will be used for similar calculations on lots of different projects and so you want to have like a master template that doesn't get modified over time and so under the review tab are a couple of tools that you can use to either protect a single sheet or to protect an entire workbook and once you use one of those it'll ask you what someone would should be able to do without the password so you know people may be able to see the cells but they won't be able to necessarily make changes and so try that out here that uh, fourth thing that was on the projectile motion tab is try the protect sheet tool and then also uh, try the protect workbook and those are both under the review tab yeah. alright so let's first of all try the protect sheet if we do protect sheet it'll ask what people should be able to do and then you have to uh, give it a password so I'm gonna put in a password here the classic password password alright so then if I go into this sheet and I try and make changes it's locked it won't let me make any changes to it I can view it and I can see the results but I can't change things unless I unprotect the sheet. Okay, so I'll do password and then it's unprotected. And you'll notice that the options changed here when I protected it. These options changed. All right, now protecting the workbook. Um, protect the workbook for structure so all right let's give this a password <coughs> all right I'm gonna save it and close it oh actually I'm not sure where this is saved uh, let me make sure about that oh okay my V drive whatever doesn't matter what you name it uh, we'll talk about that in just a minute I don't need you to turn it in quite yet okay so it's not going to prompt okay update but now something's protected about it uh, It'll let me make changes. Yeah, I guess this Protect Workbook tool isn't as powerful as Protect Sheet. So, 
unprotect. It was protecting it for structure. I'll have to look that up and see what protecting for structure is. For the meantime, if you ever do have a spreadsheet that you don't want people to mess with, the protect sheet tool is the one that can do it. And you may need to uh, select multiple sheets if you want them to, uh, to all be applied. All right, so what I'm going to need to see today is, uh, is your spreadsheet, just to make sure that you did these um, that you did these graphs, and then also save the Word document that you are working on. And you can upload both of those to the 3 slash 14. So when you click on that attach file, browse both of the documents that you, uh, that you save, both the Excel and the, uh, the Word document. And then I'll use that for updating your participation grade for today. Um, just a couple of announcements. A reminder that we're not going to have class on Thursday. That was meant to be a uh, catch-up day, and we're fully caught up right now. And then the, uh, the governor's visit tomorrow afternoon. I'd encourage you to attend that. If you aren't in class, then it should be pretty interesting discussion and uh, a spectacle and food provided. So that's at 12 o'clock down in the structures lab. And um, once you've uploaded the file to MU Online for today's uh, attendance, then that's all I've got for you today. And I'll see you after spring break.